Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast, where we focus on how authors found success, looking at strategies that have taken them to the top of the bestseller charts, as well as what they've learned from their mistakes. Because being an indie author is more than knowing the latest marketing trend. It's about being innovative and creative and learning from your mistakes. Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. I'm Sarah Rosette. And I'm Jamie Albright. And this week on the show, we have... Joanna Penn. Oh my gosh, we do. We one feel of like our heroes. Yes, one of our <laughs> heroes. We feel like it's the biggest coup ever. So, yeah, it was so, a great interview. Yeah, so we had a lot of fun talking to Joanna. She's from the Creative Pen Podcast, and we talk about a, a lot about like mindset and mm-hmm. um, like some definitions of success and a lot of really practical tips as well about like mm-hmm. uh, how to structure your life so that your writing life so that you have the type of life you want yes um, yeah yes. so really good yeah. stuff yeah it is she's always I mean she's just a wealth of information I just remember meeting her at the Smarter Artist Summit mm-hmm. before I ever put out books and we just happen to have tacos at the taco truck and sit with her at lunch it was just you yeah, were there weren't yeah. yeah it was us and and um my gosh, it was just the greatest day of my life. I just, it was so awesome. And, uh, yeah, so she's just great. She's got tons of information. She's been doing this a long time. Yeah. And she's just really practical and smart about it. Yeah, very willing to share all of her tips yes. and information. And yes, I've learned a lot just listening to her podcast over the years. So, yes. so definitely stay tuned for that. And yep. Jamie has good news this week. Yes, I have water. We <laughs> went eight days without water. Um, oh, so man. we have water. We still don't have, I mean, our, our bedroom's still not in great shape. So we're still waiting on that. But um, yeah, got water. That's really my only news this week. I'm sad to say, but um it's big well, news. So our well, whole family I, I, is very happy. Yes, yes. And I feel like we're still kind of in recovery mode. The snow is actually melted yes. and things are getting better, mm-hmm. but there's still a lot. Um a lot of people, you know, tearing out and fixing and stuff. Yeah. So and, so I think that's fine that <sighs> yay, you got water. So we'll celebrate I got water. that. That's really it. Yeah. <laughs> How about um, you? What's well, going on with you? Um, I've been back to writing this week. I've got some yeah. words in. I've hit 40,000 words. So I feel more like the mm-hmm. book is coming along. I still feel like I'm inching along, but that's yes. okay. Yeah. And i um, been looking into translations. So oh, cool. yeah. I'm doing some research for a French translation uh-huh. and the first book in the German translation, I should have it back in March, but I think I'm probably going to hold it until I have at least one or two more books in the series and then release them together. Uh So that's what I've been doing. I've been on translators cafe that Mm -hmm. um, Tony Ann Crosby told us about Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. researching that out Yep, and just kind of seeing what I can find out and kind of making a plan. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be interested to see who, who's jumping into translations after Tanya's uh, interview. Uh, Yeah. um, Yeah. It, let us know in the Facebook group or yes. send us an email or something. Cause we'd really like to know that uh, I do have a little bit of news, but if, are you done now? Cause mm-hmm. I can yeah. wait. Um, I, my novella, my quarantine novella is coming out on the first. So this podcast will be on the second. So yesterday my novella mm-hmm. came out, but I'm doing something interesting with it because I'm really using it kind of like a lead magnet only I'm selling it because I'm putting at the end I'm giving away my bride's novella for a newsletter sign up to hopefully get people into my bride's funnel mm-hmm. and then into the, my other books but um so I'm really interested to see how this goes because <laughs> um I wanted, I didn't want to just give this book away because it's not necessarily my brand, but I think it's a good thing to kind of a quarantine sort of thing to get to sell. But then I also give away my bride's novella, which really is very much in the vein of the rest of the bride's books. And so um, we'll see, we'll see how this goes and see if I, 
get an uptake in sales. I will tell y'all, um, if you can go viral on anything, go viral because <laughs> about, so when I went viral on that TikTok video, nothing, I mean, I had a pick uptake in sales and stuff, but nothing big happened. But my son-in-law said, I've heard that it usually takes about a week for, mm-hmm. for people who've gone viral to really see a huge increase Change. in any of their stuff. Yeah. And I will tell you about a week later, my sales have doubled um, and have continued to stay. I haven't changed my advertising. I'm still not. um, I really was only running ads to the first book. And um, yeah, things have continued. Isn't that weird? That's awesome though. So I'm putting it it on my to-do list. Go viral. Go go viral. (laughs) Just put it on your to-do list. Yeah. I mean, nobody... (laughs) I mean, you can't, you don't know what's going to do just it. just like a it's lightning strike. Thing. But yeah, you might as well, if it happens, you might yes. as well ride that Take wave while you can. Take advantage of it, yeah. Yeah. If and you Jamie can. will soon have a class on TikTok. Yeah. You can- <laughs> no, I'm horrible at it. In fact, I'm, when we got our water, I made a video. And, you know, it's awful. And when in doubt, just pull out the finger guns. And I was dancing with my finger guns. So, you know, that's always attractive. So, uh, but no, I do have this book coming out. So I'll let y'all know how it goes. If, if I, if using it, that using it as a lead magnet, but selling it will works for me. And even though it's not specifically in one of your series, no, it has your, Oh yeah. It's humor. It has your, your style on it. So yeah, I think it'll be early. The reviews on it have been great. The early reviews. And so, um, so that tells me that my readers at least enjoyed it. Yes. And they, yeah. and that's really, I mean, yeah. I, I always want new readers, but I always am very concerned that my readers um, get a Jamie Albright book, you yeah. know, that get what yeah. they're expecting. You want to make so, them yeah. happy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, so, good. Can't yeah. wait to hear how it goes. Well, so I'll let you know. I'll let okay. you know. Well, let's get on with the interview because Joanna has a lot more interesting things to say. <laughs> All right. Here we go. So today we're really excited to have Joanna Penn with us. Hi, Joanna. How are you today? Hello. It's so great to see you guys. Uh, We're so happy you're here. (laughs) So let me read your bio real quick, and then we'll jump right into the questions. Joanna Penn writes nonfiction for authors and is an award-nominated New York Times and USA Today bestselling author as J.F. Penn. She is also an award-winning podcaster, creative entrepreneur, and an international professional speaker. And we are super excited you're here. So tell us how you got into writing. Well, I think, you know, like many of us, I've always written journals. Uh, I have a lot of angsty teenage journals (laughs) with bad poetry in. (laughs) And um, but I never really thought it was possible to write for anything, anything creative, I think. So uh, I did sort of business writing as part of my consulting job. And I was just really miserable in my job. And, you know, I'd been doing it for a decade. I was like, what am I doing with my life? Like, like, you know, when you hit that sort of early 30s, mid 30s, and I was like, what am I doing? I have to change my life you know I'm just paying the bills uh, is this all there is so I at that one and that was when um Tim Ferriss wrote the four-hour work week mm-hmm. uh, back then and uh I, and he talked a lot about lifestyle design and so I started writing a non-fiction book which later became career change in order to change my own life I thought okay how do I change my life I'll write a book about how you find a job that makes you happy <laughs> and and that was sort of 2006 to 2008 and in the the process of doing that I discovered that what I actually liked doing was writing <laughs> and uh, and then I looked at the publishing process and all of that and so essentially I got into writing um, for books in order to try and change my life but mm. Um, that then you know, obviously we're going to get into what you'd wish you'd known and stuff yeah. but it, <laughs> that initial book it, it didn't sell very many copies at all it didn't really change other people's lives but it changed my life mm. and that would be an immediate tip you know that first book it might not be a massive seller or whatever but it could change your life because what I discovered was yes I like writing yes I like um books I want to do I want to do this Mm -hmm. and it kind of really helped me so yeah that was that was um it really was I was very unhappy with my life and my career and I wanted to make a change that's fantastic that you were able to dive into something totally new 
And now, you know, you're pretty far down this road of being an entrepreneur as an author and writing books. So what is your what is your definition of success now? Well, now, <laughs> I mean, I think that is a really important point. It, it changes over time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like anyone with your first book, you're like, my definition of success is make a million dollars and become <laughs> famous and whatever. And but that, you know, that doesn't really happen. So my first goal was to leave my job. And I left my job in 2011. And then my next goal was to make six figures. And I did that in like 2015-ish. And then it was make multi-six figures and sustain that mm. every year. And this is obviously, you guys know, it's about making a living. It's not about just getting one paycheck. It's about the long-term thing. Because I never wanted to go back for, to my day job. <laughs> so I'm, you know, since it's just, it's almost a decade since I left my job. I don't even know if I could get a job anymore <laughs> doing no. anything that's what I say um, all the time yeah, yeah exactly. unemployable yeah yes exactly <laughs> unemployable so it's interesting so my goal still is to continue having a sustainable income that enables me to live the life I like to live and we're not particularly extravagant people um you know but I do like traveling <laughs> obviously <laughs> I haven't been able to spend money on that for a while uh due to the pandemic but for me my definition first definition of success is to keep doing this um and to be able to write the books I want when I want to not have have to do things mm -hmm. um and to have a happy working life because that was my I was so miserable in that job and so I'm very focused on what do I really enjoy like this I love podcasting you guys must do too because yes. you keep doing it yes. <laughs> exactly and then it's funny because in I just hit my decade of fiction uh, which, you know, I started with nonfiction, then moved into fiction. So I've had a decade of fiction now and I've got over a million words published in fiction. And it's funny now because now I have a kind of goal to win some kind of literary prize. I would like to be an award winning uh, fiction author as well. So that's a kind of crafty type goal. But my primary goal is to continue with that lifestyle design to write what I want, when I want, work the way I like and uh, and travel when I can. <laughs> right, right. Very good. Well, what do you wish you'd known about writing in craft when you started? Well, I was I was thinking about this and I still remember how annoyed I used to get with all the authors who would say, just write more books, like <laughs> stop obsessing about this one book. <laughs> and, I, and I realized I'm one of those people. And so are you two. You mm -hmm. two are also yes. <laughs> those people. And so if people listening, you know, if you're just starting, I know it can be really annoying. And in terms of the craft side, I think it's that I didn't know that you can get better with practice right. I think the idea of practice is very very under emphasized mm -hmm. in the writing community I mean we say write more books but part of that is if you write more books you're going to get better especially if you work with professional editors if you try and challenge your process right. if you if you examine your um where your weaknesses are for example or if you you know you just focus on and keep reading you know as Stephen King says you know readers are writers <laughs> writers are readers mm -hmm. and you you have to keep improving so that's why I've added this literary prize goal in because I want to become better at my craft and and that has actually been interesting in the last few weeks I've been reflecting on why do I feel that I still don't know how to write a novel properly when I've written like 18 yeah, <laughs> and they've got good reviews and I've made lots of money and all of this. And it's like, why do I still feel like this? So I think what I wish I'd known is that, yes, you get better with practice, but also perhaps that you will always feel self-doubt mm -hmm. and that you will always want to get better. And that's why this is a good career because you can do this for the rest of your life and it will keep challenging you you will never stagnate if you keep pushing the envelope of what you can achieve mm -hmm. um so I think that's what I I, I now think about this sort of long-term body of work and if I had known at the beginning don't be too despondent if that first book doesn't sell really well or if you don't suddenly achieve all those things you thought you would achieve you may well achieve them in the next decade if you keep going so yeah I think getting better with practice both both at writing craft and everything everything yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's very true that we start out and we're so focused on that first book or that first series. But if you keep going, you have so many more opportunities to expand your knowledge and, you know, how you do things and your craft is very true. Yeah. So, and and then, sorry, yeah. I was also going to say, I, I'm, um, I've just been looking at a publisher's weekly study that um, said that 67% of books sold in 2020 were backlist mm. of books. And it was the biggest year in US based publishing book sales for a decade. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So this is a really big uh, sort of aha moment for publishing <laughs> which and I was on Ingram webinar and they were saying the same thing that this statistic is a big one for them but it's also important for us as indies um, and just in authors in general so if 67% of your revenue let's say comes from your backlist then you need to grow a backlist <laughs> you and a backlist they defined as books that were over a year old and so yeah. that is, I think that's a really big thing for us is realizing that that's the way it is. And actually, I mean, we know this, but it's much easier to sell backlist titles because you they have more reviews, you can put mm-hmm. sales promos on them. Uh, mm-hmm. They've got more metadata. You know, we've talked about them on podcasts for years. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so they have, it's much easier to, to sell them. And of course, a book is new to whoever discovers it next. So I wanted to bring that statistic up. I think, I think we've forget that yeah that's true and I will tell you that in the romance community in particular this year I have heard I mean that backlist is king in the romance community this year that's what everyone is talking about at Mm. the romance author mastermind in December um that there were multiple sessions on backlist uh, books and stuff like that so yeah that's I think maybe 2020 with people having trouble creating a front list the back list does become <laughs> it helps <laughs> yeah it does it helps well what about marketing what do you wish you had known about marketing uh, anything about marketing <laughs> <laughs> so, so um so, and I, I hope again I hope this encourages people so essentially I wrote this book um which uh, was actually called how to enjoy your job or find a new one and I was like right uh, how do I how do I uh, sell this book um well what I did was print 2000 copies and then I said how do I sell this book so this was before the Kindle this was before print on demand really took off so uh, I was like okay well obviously I need to do press releases and get on tv that will clearly sell (laughs) loads of books so between January 2008 and December 2008 so pretty much that whole year of 2008 I did press releases. I was living in Australia at the time. I made it onto national TV, national radio, loads of newspapers, and I only sold a couple of books. <laughs> so I was like, what is going on? This is ridiculous. This is what everyone says you're meant to do. You know, I, I got reviews in places and it just didn't shift any books at all. And so by the end of um, sort of 2008, I had discovered digital marketing and uh, started my podcast, which I started in December 2008 and started podcasting in March 2009. So essentially, I I spent a whole year uh, focusing on traditional media. But as soon as I switched my focus to online, as soon as I discovered online, I just dumped all of that and literally (laughs) I I haven't written a press release since and I just don't go anywhere near any of that um you know for me it's very much about online marketing and and I don't want this was I didn't do any paid ads until maybe 2016 2017 yeah when they became what you had to do you know when Amazon really stopped doing the Mm -hmm. uh you know uh organic reach so though that first seven eight years was all just uh sort of building it through content marketing and everything so yes <laughs> what I did what I wish I'd known was that uh, online anything about online marketing or in fact anything about marketing at all and it's interesting because I wrote the first edition of how to market a book I actually wrote that probably in 20 maybe 2011 something like that oh wow yeah because uh for me I write non-fiction in order to figure out what I need to learn Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) and so I wrote that once I was like okay I know enough and the first edition actually has a lot on writing press releases because I was really good at that (laughs) 
<laughs> before giving up. You go up. with your strengths. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And then obviously things are quite different now, but, and things are so much better. And I want to say that as well, because I feel like, oh, authors can be real moany. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm like oh I'm just I missed the gold rush or I missed this or yeah. it's too late to do this or that or the other mm-hmm. and it's so not true this is actually the best time we right. have more opportunities than ever and growing opportunities than ever and um, you know we were just uh, talking before the recording about the growth in digital in Europe mm-hmm. you know online sales have just taken off big time and we, we're going to have a, a crop of readers who discovered digital during the pandemic and so and many of us have I know the pandemic is terrible and all that but many of us have had one of the best sales years in a long time because Mm -hmm. of the um the amount of people buying online Mm -hmm. so yeah I would say yes I wish I'd known about that and if you're listening and you don't know about these things then you can definitely learn and it's it's Mm -hmm. never too late yeah well and that's what I tell people all the time I mean you can learn to market your book I mean I had zero zero experience in marketing at all and but if that's what you really you know if you if you really focus on that because there's so much so many resources that are free um they're paid resources as well but there are a lot of free resources that you can learn to do really anything you want to learn to do uh youtube is your friend so um yeah. yeah, definitely. And also I'd say, um, you know, there are yeah, obviously there are some great people doing things like press releases and PR for authors, mm-hmm. but I have I don't think and maybe you guys have, but I've never really met an indie author who has done that and wanted to continue doing it. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I don't, we, I don't I think, either. Yeah, yeah. I think we get better results doing it the way we, you mentioned, like the online content marketing ads doing things like that, move a lot more books. And I was like you, I started out and I was like, Oh, do all these press releases and I'll do things like that. And I have a long list of things that I've never done again because they just (laughs) don't don't work. (laughs) And I mean, I I think that you like, for example, I never turned down a, a, an interview on say um, traditional media. So I've done sure. plenty of radio as well as podcasts and, and I've been on TV as well here in the UK and I, I don't turn that stuff down, but I don't have a, uh, expectations of selling any books off the back of it I just put it on my website as as seen on Sky TV right 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 <laughs> and that's it's about authority. it it's authority yes. building right it's yeah, yeah exactly yeah. Yeah. It's brand like, rather yeah. than sales yeah. yeah exactly what assumptions did you make at the beginning of your writing career and looking back did they turn out to be right or wrong Well, I think the biggest thing is that in 2008, I assumed that I would leave my job and become a nonfiction author and speaker. Mm -hmm. So I joined the Professional Speakers Association. I was organizing my own events. I was doing kind of keynotes. Uh, My business model was to do in-person events, speaking and uh, and consulting. And I did mm-hmm. start doing services at that time. So I did in-person speaking and I did in-person consulting. And so I assumed that was the way it was going to go. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly never considered writing fiction. And in fact, um, I only started writing a novel during NaNoWriMo in 2009 because someone came on my podcast, uh, Tom mm-hmm. Evans, I remember, uh, and it said... I think you have a block around writing fiction. And I was like, no, not me. (laughs) But it turned out I had a lot of stuff to get over with with writing fiction. But so, yeah, so I I assumed I would be a nonfiction author and speaker. And I certainly never assumed that podcasting and audio would be anything more than a tiny aspect of marketing or even just networking and what's so interesting now of course is you know fiction is a big part of my life and my career but podcasting I love podcasting I have two podcasts (laughs) and you know and it makes and it also makes me a full-time equivalent income on its Mm -hmm. own so podcasting has turned into so much more than I would ever have thought and I have written so much more than I ever would have thought and Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, well, is it Tony Robbins or someone said, you know, you you overestimate what you can do in a year and underestimate what you can do in a decade. Right, right. Exactly. Yeah. And now I'm at, what am I, at 13 years 
mm-hmm. doing this since publishing that first book and so you know it, you can definitely achieve a lot if you just keep doing stuff over and over again <laughs> right and and iterating on it yeah mm. yeah mm. Well, have you ever made a mistake that turned out to be a good thing? Uh, well, I tend to think that all mistakes can turn out to be a good thing. Mm-hmm. I don't like uh, the word failure. <laughs> right. You, you know, so I do try and re- reframe every single mistake. Um, and in fact, but I actually did a whole episode on this recently, episode 529 on my <laughs> podcast is on mistakes, failures, setbacks generally. But um, my biggest mistake slash epic fail was I had a scuba diving business in New Zealand back in the day with my then husband <laughs> so I'm now on my on a happy second marriage uh, but so I I married a scuba dive instructor and boat skipper and we uh, at the time I was an IT consultant but at the weekends and everything we would run this uh, scuba diving um thing and we had a we rented a boat so we had and it wasn't just a boat it was <laughs> kind of a luxury launch and ah. oh it cost me so much money that that business and it crashed and burned within a few months uh, including my marriage so mm. it was a uh, it was heading that way anyway but it it was just everything i now have and am is related to that epic fail because I learned for example um in terms of my marriage I learned what I wanted and who I needed to be to have a successful marriage and I've been married for um 13 years so it's doing better Mm -hmm. and in terms of business I learned that I did not want to be dependent on a physical location so we were in the poor nights in New Zealand I did not want physical equipment I I did not want a boat Mm -hmm. (laughs) I did not want Mm -hmm. to have scuba dive equipment Uh, I never want to have employees (laughs) I do not want to have the pain of the price of fuel which changes every day so the variable income to be dependent on the weather is Mm -hmm. utterly ridiculous Um, and obviously some people do have businesses that depend on the weather but I was like I do not want that Mm -hmm. um I also I mean the insurance was something that could actually kill people Mm -hmm. uh and the serve and it was a service industry and I learned that I am not someone who wants to help people put on fins or run and get them a (laughs) sick bag or so basically I learned that I wanted like a location independent business a digital business that i could run from my laptop on my own but still make a ton of money mm-hmm. and in an industry that I cared about more than just a hobby mm-hmm. and so you can see I mean that it was a very expensive mistake mm-hmm. but it turned out and of course I <laughs> I wasn't like oh it's it's ended and I just got up and carried on I mean it took mm-hmm. a good couple of years to get over a lot of those uh, issues but mm-hmm. Now I look back and realize that that was such a pivotal thing. And if I hadn't have made those mistakes, then I wouldn't be in the business I have now because I know what I want. So, for example, people say to me all the time, why don't you sell physical books, signed physical books? Why don't you do that? And I'm like, well, because I don't want to have stock. I don't want to have physical stuff. I don't want to have to sign things. I don't want to go to the post office. And yeah, sure, I might be leaving some money on the table, but equally, it just doesn't fit with my design, the business, my lifestyle design. So yeah, is, is, is that too much of an epic fail? No, <laughs> no, it, but I think you're right. I mean, I've had, I've, especially since I've started doing this, tried to restructure how I think about failure, because in the States in particular, failure is just, it's such a dirty word. And, but really it's, it's not because if you take it and do what you did, you know, and learn from it. And then for me, because it takes me twice as long to do just about anything because I have to do it, screw it up, then go back and do it again and fix it. <laughs> it but I learned to do it. And mm-hmm. if, but if I had taken on that, Oh, I've screwed up. I can't do it, I wouldn't have done anything. I wouldn't have yeah. set up a website, a, a, you know, or a newsletter or anything because all of those things required me screwing it up and then fixing it and making, you know, making it better. So um, 
I just think that's so important. And, you know, those were big, those were big things and they did take you a while to get over, but you've created an entire life, you know, Mm. based on those things. I think that's amazing. And you don't chase, like you were talking about the physical books. I know a lot of people that will do, oh, well, this will make me a little bit of money and this will make me a little bit of money. And they chase around things and they kind of like, they don't have their ultimate Yeah, they goals don't have a mind. straight path. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. easy to get distracted. And I, I think that that idea of the the what lifestyle do you want? Because you yeah. know, if you want to you obviously not everyone does writing full time. Sure. But if you do want to be to do this full time, th- you do have to learn a whole load of stuff. But also you really have to be very sure about how you want your life to look because for example if you've I I mean since in all the time I've been doing this so many people have left writing Mm -hmm. because they've burned out for example and you know I know um Jamie you you do one a one a year you're kind Mm -hmm. of famous for that and I don't I I mean some years I do (laughs) well no I think I've done at least one novel a year and usually I'll do a not a non-fiction as well this year obviously pandemic I've done a few more but Mm -hmm. usually I'm and some people would say, oh, slow writer. But actually, no, that's kind of more normal writer. It's the, yeah. it's the going book a month that actually is uh, very, very difficult. And when I looked at what I love to do, I thought, you know what, I'm just, that's not me. So I'm not even going to try it. Right. And I think that's very important to, um, or for example, uh, Amazon ads. I tried it. I hated it. So I don't do it. And yes, I'm leaving uh, books, uh, book sales probably on the table, but I, I, my life is too important. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd rather do something else. <laughs> I agree. I agree completely. And and you have to look at where you're at in your life because I'm a little farther along in my life, and there are things that I really want to do with the people in my family, and um, you know, that yes. don't lend themselves to being. A book a month kind of person you know so yeah well what about the opposite have you ever had something that you thought was like a brilliant idea and it turned out to be not so great <laughs> well we I all thinking, have these well to be honest that is everything else I mean I thought having a scuba diving company was a brilliant idea I thought marrying a scuba diving instructor was a good idea <laughs> Because of your um, romance books, Jamie, I, I, I have to tell people, you know, I, I, I don't talk about this very often, but basically I went backpacking around New Zealand. I was in Australia, went to New Zealand. The very first day I went out on the boat, uh, so this is a gorgeous boat, gorgeous uh-huh. day. There were whales and dolphins. It was all very wonderful and romantic. I was 26 and I went home with the that, that guy that night and we got <laughs> married like six months later. <laughs> Oh, that's my next book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so basically it was a classic. Yeah. What should have stayed as a holiday romance uh, yes. turned into a hell of a lot more. But it's, um, yeah, so coming back to what was a brilliant idea, it turned out not so great. Uh, again, I don't regret, I haven't. I never have any regrets. I don't think yeah. so. Yeah. I might sometimes regret having one too many gins at an author conference. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, no. Who I, has I, it? I, yeah. <laughs> but um I I was I try and think of a good one and I have got one that's not a regret but I would do it differently and I hope this helps people and it's too late for me to change so in around 2012 I had three novels out and under Joanna Penn and I had everything under Joanna Penn and then what I really started to learn about with the algorithms and also I I really wanted to separate my persona and uh so I went with the JK Rowling approach oh oh, that was it I also got a review on one of my books which said I can't believe a woman wrote this oh yeah and I write kind of action adventure and stuff Mm -hmm. like that so Mm -hmm. which is a very male dominated niche and also in fantasy used to be a lot more male dominated not anymore but it it was and the reason JK Rowling went with JK was the gender non-specific and a Mm. lot of guys do this in romance right a lot of guys write with yeah, with the uh, with uh, anyway, the point is that I went with J.F. Penn, and my middle name is Francis. This is actually my name, so Joanna Francis Penn. But the problem is, <laughs> is the F is really difficult. So oh. using F as a middle initial. So if I say um, J. 
J.F. Penn, it could sound like S, S for sugar, instead uh, of yeah. F for Francis. Also, uh-huh. Francis can be spelt in different ways. So when I say J.F. Penn, I have to really pronounce the F. And uh-huh. then also, this is another big deal, the, there is either a space or no space after F. It's either J.F. space pen mm-hmm. or J.F space pen or okay. there's so many variations of how to spell um names with yes. uh you know with middle initials so if people listening you know get it it's like seriously so if i was starting again now also the search on kobo and apple doesn't work properly if you oh. don't get all the dots and things oh wow oh it's an absolute nightmare so essentially <laughs> i oh. Now, if I was doing it, I would probably go with Joe Penn. So either just J-O Penn or Mm -hmm. Joe, J-O-E Penn to make it a kind of still gender neutral. Because Joe in America particularly is mainly a male name, but Joe can be a female name too, right? Right. Yeah. So I think my recommendation to people is make sure you can say something out loud without it being misconstrued. So I was trying to think of an initial middle initial that would have worked better for me. (laughs) (laughs) And it's actually really hard to think of one when you say it out loud Um, or try and avoid initials altogether. Or if you're going to go with initials or you already have initials, you you need to check the spaces. So for example, even today I went on Kobo and found that a book three in my series had turned up separately, not linked to my Mm -hmm. series because I I missed the space. (laughs) I was like, oh no. So, okay. So this is a brilliant idea is to have a second name for my fiction, but the not so great angle was what I chose, which Mm -hmm. happens to be my real (laughs) initial. Initials. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, I find that too, even just like friends that I have that use their initials, I'm like, is there a period or is it just the, you know, F? I don't know. And yeah. So I have to go look it up. So that is actually a big one for this Wish I Would Have Known podcast, Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. seriously, everyone said, oh, initial. In fact, I I don't think I've heard that from anyone else. Right? I mean, you know, it really is a pain Mm -hmm. in the neck. Yeah. 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 I could see how it could be a challenge. And I think, too, with pen names, like if you're going to pick one, it would be really hard because you need to pick like if you pick something like McMahon, is it MC? or MAC, you know, yes. there's like so many, you would have to try and like not have you know, all these variations. I think it'd be very, very challenging. Right. Well, and that's why with my mum, cause I helped my mum write uh, some sweet romance and right. she, uh, we chose Penny Appleton and I spent a long time coming up with pen. I thought pen, cause you know, it's is a yeah. little bit related, but yeah. then Appleton is a sort of, there's no way of spelling it wrong really. Mm-hmm. And also it's yeah. quite mm-hmm. English, English countryside, mm-hmm. which is what yes. her books are. So, so I, I knew enough when I got to do her books about it, but it's too late for me as JF Penn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's true. Well, I know this, I know the answer to this question, but well, I'm going to ask it for our listeners, but tell us how important you think mindset is. Yeah. Well, as you said, you know, it's yeah. absolutely <laughs> critical um, because because this is such a long term thing like the more yes. we talk about this the more you go through it you if you don't have an overarching reason why you yes. will give up you mm-hmm. absolutely will give up because you have the psychological aspects of self doubt and fear mm-hmm. of failure and judgment and comparisonitis i think you guys talked about that recently mm-hmm. yeah and all the it, time yeah yeah <laughs> For some reason, that never seems to go away. Mm. And um, at the beginning, you also won't make any money. Mm -hmm. And you'll feel every bad review is some kind of personal slight. And you'll be frustrated because you have to learn technical things. And you'll be overwhelmed. And like like it it doesn't stop you guys know this it it doesn't actually stop so you need to have an overarching reason why and you also need to kind of decide who you are and what you want to achieve and all of that but you also need to have like we've mentioned this growth mindset the fact that you can learn this and that Mm -hmm. none of us believe that you are born able to (laughs) write a perfect book or market a book or run a business you have to learn all these things so if you have a growth mindset around learning that's much better I also think you need a creative and abundant mindset Mm -hmm. because we you know certainly the three of us and you know in our community people listening I think you know this 
we focus on the positive side of creation and the, that there is enough for all of us and and a growing market and so we help other people and we have we are friends with authors and we celebrate even though we might sometimes have comparisonitis we still celebrate the success of other authors and we promote other authors and we you know we do all of those things that demonstrate a, an abundance mindset and we don't say to people oh, why don't you stop writing? You know, mm-hmm. give give someone else a chance. Do you remember when somebody wrote that about JK Rowling? Like, why does she continue to write? Why doesn't she let other people have a go? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, well, because she's a writer. <laughs> <laughs> That's her job. Yeah, I know. And, and yeah, also and because I she loves that. to create. You yes, know? yes. I hate that. Um, there's only so much of the pie and I'm going to keep my, you know, the secretive aspect of some things. Mm. I hate that. Um, I just, I can't get on board with that because um, I just believe there's enough for all of us. And I think that's because, you know, when I started writing, I was listening to the self-publishing podcast and that was their, you know, that was their mentality. You were on there. I was listening to you. That was your mentality. And so that's just how, what, what I came up with and, um, or, came up in this business with. And so I feel like we just, there's just plenty. There's plenty. Mm. So. And we, we all grow mm-hmm. the market together. Mm-hmm. You know, for example, you know, talking about selling, selling direct, um, the more pe- the more authors who sell direct, the more people will buy direct right. from authors mm-hmm. because we're encouraging people. And we, each one of us say, look, Um, you know we will make more money to keep writing if you buy direct from us Mm -hmm. Um, whereas yes of course you can buy on whatever platform you like but you know for every person we encourage to do that they will probably go on and buy a book from someone else or join a patreon or you know support creators Um, so yeah I feel like this abundance mentality is so important, but also the long-term mindset. I keep coming back to that, but the more I do this, the more I realize it's so important. Right. Yes. Yes. Mindset is everything. I didn't realize that when I started, but I think it's the key to mm-hmm. keeping going. Mm-hmm. So you have an update coming out for one of your books on how to make a living with your writing. So we wanted to talk to you about that a little bit and ask, I know part of what you 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 emphasize a lot is multiple streams of income, and I think that's just so important for writers. So, what advice would you have for someone who's just starting out who wants to create multiple streams of income? Any tips for them? And then um, for someone that's farther along, would you advise something different or the same? Yeah. So uh, again. <laughs> I think you have to decide that you're going to do this. Multiple streams of income doesn't happen by accident. (laughs) Um, And to me, it's not just about writing multiple books in one series. I mean, you know, I I know uh, we've all got multiple different series, Mm -hmm. but um, for me, it's more than that. So it is trying to think about an ecosystem. That's the way I'm thinking about it now, where over time, everything feeds each other. So, um, yeah, and if you keep this long-term view, it's easier to build and also you can take it slow. So, for example, affiliate income, which is receiving a commission on selling someone else's books or products or courses. I knew before I even built my website that I wanted to make affiliate income Mm -hmm. because I understood and I knew a lot of people who were making like six figures from affiliate income, which to me seemed like magic. (laughs) You, You don't have to make the product. You don't have to do the customer customer service you don't have to do anything but drive traffic right. and of course it's very important that you um are ethical about it and I'm very ethical about it everyone knows I do it I always say I do it mm-hmm. and um and only you know uh, be an affiliate for good products and services but that first year so the first year I just started with Amazon affiliate for example I made one dollar seventy eight yeah <laughs> but now I make six figures a year from affiliate income wow. and that is literally every every time I put something on a blog or in my book so if you in fact if you get how to make a living with your writing the third edition out 15th of March 2021 uh, you will find that well there is a whole chapter on affiliate marketing but I it, the book is also full of examples so so uh, I have a tutorial on how to use vellum for example um, and that I have my vellum affiliate link to it and that's in the book and so 
the long term view of how I wanted to do that meant, has meant that over the years, as I've had more traffic, as I've written more books, as I've you know been on more podcasts like this and all of that, it has and built my email list. All of that has grown. And that is the idea to keep in mind with multiple streams of income. It's how if I put this thing into my ecosystem how will it amplify everything else? Mm. So, for example, um, the podcast, you know, the po- my podcast mm-hmm. on its own makes multiple streams of income through um, obviously marketing and talking about affiliate stuff and my own books and courses, but also from advertising and from Patreon. So it's really thinking about how do you incorporate all these different things into everything you do in a way that serves the audience <laughs> mm-hmm. you, and that it, it, it sounds difficult when I say it out loud but it's just been really slow mm-hmm. so the other thing I would do is definitely start your email list day one so mm-hmm. I started the creative pen email list I had a blueprint from day one in December 2008 and that is the basis of my business mm-hmm. absolutely so and the same with my fiction you know same yeah. thing yeah So, yeah, it really is just considering that something small like your email list or your affiliate income or your book sales income in year one will be pretty crap. (laughs) (laughs) But that if you keep building it out, if you think about that sort of a spider web image, for example, and every year you kind of add another ring or or tree, a tree growing all those rings, it gets bigger and bigger or the snowball metaphor. There are so many metaphors because it's true. (laughs) Yes, yes. (laughs) Yes. And it is the long game. It's yes. knowing that you're going to start small and being okay with that and then mm. waiting for it, being patient enough to see the see it come to fruition later. Yes. And also not to think that you're a failure if in year one or year three or even year five, like if yeah. you think about how long businesses take to make a profit, mm-hmm. it, it's something ridiculous. Like it takes five years for a business to make a profit. And I think too many authors don't give it that much time they think right oh we give it first. about six months <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah or I'm 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 um, talking to Stephen Pressfield I've, I've recorded the interview but Stephen Pressfield uh I asked him again about the war of art so many of us have read the war of art right it's mm-hmm. an iconic book but it yes. took a decade between him releasing that book and him going on Oprah <laughs> mm. oh I didn't realize that Exactly. Well, and we yeah. all think, oh, Stephen Pressfield, yeah, he put out that and he just did so well with it. But no, it took a decade. Mm-hmm. And so at that point, it was his backlist book. Yeah, <laughs> It was definitely his backlist book. Exactly. Exactly. So you're a futurist. And so I want to know, like, what you see coming, like subscription services are growing in popularity with readers. What can authors do to prepare for a shift in revenue streams? Well, it, it's it's too big a question to say what's coming. So we, we will just, we'll just focus on subscription. Yeah, we'll um, yeah but it, I think subscription has been around for a while. And I feel like many authors just think KU is the only subscription model, right. but it's not. Mm-hmm. It's the only exclusive subscription model. Yes. Um, the rest of them are non-exclusive. So I love subscription models. I just don't love the exclusive ones. So, um, you know, we've got Kobo Plus, you've got Scribd, you've got um, uh, Storytel and you've got Light. And people forget about libraries. This is another brilliant thing that's happened in the pandemic is that people have moved to library borrowing digitally. So they're browsing. This was another thing in this Ingram uh, webinar I went to. People are now discovering books by browsing library websites. And of course it's a bit like um uh, other online bookstores you can show so many more books on a website than you can in on your physical library shelves and people will just stumble upon things and the seo um, search engine optimization also helps so think about libraries as like a subscription model even though it's free for the user you still get paid and um, draft to digital has a paper checkout model for example which is essentially a subscription then we've got obviously all the audio models so what i would say is many authors think that the subscription is a an apocalypse and so do the publishers but it's very interesting because i think you just have to change your mindset to look this is what customers want 
you know, I personally have Netflix and Amazon Prime and mm -hmm. Audible and I have, uh, you know, lots of other things. I pay subscription, Spotify, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so how do I access readers and listeners on those platforms? But how do I use it more like a funnel? Mm -hmm. So, yes, you'll get a micro payment for something or page reads or whatever small paper checkouts um micro it is a micro payment but how do you use that as a way to cultivate a thousand true fans which is kevin kelly's idea of mm -hmm. okay if you can get a thousand people to actually want to pay a bit more money then you can make a living so i, I mentioned um, selling direct for example you can make 90 percent revenue on a ebook or audiobook rather than 5% or 30% or 70%. So I, and this is a massive growth revenue stream for me over the last year, I've really been focusing on it. So you can make four, you know, over $4 on a $4.99 ebook. You wow. can make $16 on a $20 audiobook. <laughs> Yeah. And this is this makes a huge difference. So what I would say to people, I mean, or you can crowdfund special editions, you can uh, funnel people to a Patreon, you can do merchandise, you can do hardbacks, you can do all these different things. So for me, subscription services, I think you have to consider them as necessary mm -hmm. and use them as uh, like this podcast. This mm -hmm. podcast is a great example, right? This is not directly monetizable necessarily, but some people love your stuff and will buy your books. Some people might discover me this way and buy mm -hmm. my books. And it's a funnel into other revenue streams. Right. And that's how we have to think about subscription. So yeah, I would encourage people to think about it from the reader, listener perspective. People want this. So how do you adapt so that you have other higher forms of income in other ways? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think it's a, I'm, I'm going through a mindset set shift about subscription in that, or in the way that people are finding and, and reading my things, because I would think, oh, I'll write the book and put it out and then we'll buy it. But thinking about it like this, perhaps I need to come up with other like box sets or special editions that they can get directly from me. Mm -hmm. And it's like just a, just a little tweak to give you just a different aspect. It's just a new way of thinking about marketing the books. So yes, yeah, very you're exactly right. And doing things. So for example, you know, maybe you put all of your, maybe one of your series, you put all your books in one series on, or, you know, yeah, put all of one series and then you keep a, diff a separate mm -hmm. series you keep and you only sell that direct or you sell that separately or you do a mega box set, which you yes. sell direct from your website, which is mm -hmm. like 30 bucks, which is, yeah. you know, with all your books in that you could never sell on the other platforms because you can't get high enough royalties. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those are the types of things, of course, um, uh, book funnel is enabling us to do direct audio and people will pay more for audio right so yes. this I this is I'm finding absolutely brilliant you know you I and what is also brilliant about selling direct is the money appears in your bank account within minutes sometimes oh, that's, that's awesome isn't it yeah <laughs> oh it's so good so I just I love I I you know we don't like going on email a lot right but I love get, whenever I open my email I have made a few more dollars and I can see it. And I know mm -hmm. we have that on other platforms too, but you don't, it doesn't end up in your bank account. <laughs> right. yes. So I would really encourage people to, yeah, as, you, as you're doing, think about what are the ways you can offer different things to different levels of the funnel. You know, we're too used mm -hmm. to thinking, well, everything has to be at $4.99 or everything has right. to be at this price. Whereas we need to start thinking about these other tiers, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's very true. Mm -hmm. That's very true. Well, we're getting near the end of our time and we just have a couple more quick questions. And this one is a big one, but um, <laughs> this isn't what, a quick one, but yeah. <laughs> what are you looking forward to in 2021? Oh, no, this is a quick one because I'm <laughs> getting out the house. <laughs> okay, that's easy then. <laughs> well, I think uh, as we were saying before, you know, in the UK, this is I'm still in my in the third lockdown and our yes. lockdown has been oh. a lot harder than a lot of your stuff in America. And so I am I literally as someone who this is the first time since the mid 1980s that mm. I have I have stayed in one place for this long. I mean, seriously, my family, you know, my mum took us to Africa in 1983 uh you know so it, it's kind of <laughs> I'm so desperate to get out of here yeah. and it's funny I've been working really hard to get 
books out so that I can pretty much take a whole load of time off and just go and do stuff and travel and so yeah that is essentially what I'm looking forward to is um I don't think it will go back to where it was like the new normal it will be different but Mm -hmm. I am certainly getting my vaccine and getting on a plane (laughs) and getting on a train and going for a walk and yes Yes. (laughs) all of the above oh I know I know well tell us what you think the best thing you've done to set yourself up for success has been uh, well, I think as we've been talking about, it's the long term view. But the thing is, at the beginning, you don't know that you don't know you have. You, I mean, you don't have a long term view. Mm-hmm. But what I have done is I've kept going. And I think if you find I, I almost feel like it was a benefit to me having a job that I hated mm-hmm. because I was so committed to making this work. And when I discovered that I really liked writing books, well, it was OK. I'm just going to keep going. So since 2006, really, when I started writing, I haven't stopped writing. I haven't stopped blogging. I haven't stopped podcasting. I haven't stopped connecting. But essentially, I have just done the same things every month, really. (laughs) Almost every day. I do work really hard (laughs) since 2006. So, yeah. So the best thing I've done, I think, is keep going. (laughs) Well, I say this all the time. We only fail if we quit. So yeah if you well, keep oh, going. I know I'm gonna ch- I'm gonna challenge that Jamie oh gosh good some people <laughs> some people this is not the right job uh, so in the same yeah. way that I had a job that paid me really really well mm-hmm. in in IT consulting but I I just hated it I was so miserable and what I you know some people f- want to write one book or two books and that's it for them they're done but mm-hmm. and so you I know mean, maybe they write in other ways or they, so I don't think there's any failure or shame in mm-hmm. quitting Okay. If if you are quitting for the right reasons, which is you you have tried and you have said, okay, this is not for me. I'm going to go do. I'm going to go find the thing I want to do. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. So I think yeah. it's the best thing to do is to know yourself and figure out what you want with your life, right. and then do that. And if that's writing, yay, join us. <laughs> and if yes. it's not, no worries you go do something else. And right. and I think that's important because as you talked about the different stages of our lives, so I have been doing this for a while and I did have a bit of a thing a couple of years ago where I was like, do I want to continue doing this? Mm-hmm. You know, I've written all these books. Is Do I just want to keep writing books? What else do I want to do right. with my life? Right. And then I eventually came back to, you know what, I wanted to write some more books. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think it's having that blueprint that you talked about, you know, and um, knowing what that is. And if you get to a different stage in your life, that blueprint can change a little bit, you know. And yeah, stuff, so. exactly. Or maybe, yeah. you know, maybe you decide, okay, I'm going to write one book every five years or yes. I just, you know, I'm going to take a year off. I mean, I have yeah. thought about that. Like, okay, what if I took a sabbatical from mm-hmm. from this? You know, would it, would it all just fall apart if I took a sabbatical? I don't know. There's a big idea. Yeah. <laughs> that's the next podcast well we would miss you that's for sure yeah well well, who knows (laughs) you'd be like one day oh what what happened to joanna's whatever happened to her (laughs) no i just had to throw that in because we do enjoy your podcast and we listen and we do appreciate just all the information that you share and the knowledge it's just it's really helped me a lot so yeah just what you do for the community i think it's so awesome yeah. Well, that's the thing. I don't think I could take you off because I like my job. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell everyone where they can find out more about your podcast and your books. Sure. Well, since we're on a podcast, come on over to the Creative Pen Podcast. Right. Uh, and Sarah was on the other week. So not sure when this goes out, but you were on my show recently. And mm. I also have another show called Books and Travel. And that is my alter ego, Joe Francis <laughs> Penn, does that show um, uh, talking about the sort of travel behind people's books. Um, or you can come over to my website, thecreativepen.com with a double N and, and everything's there. Sounds awesome. great. Thank you yeah. so much for being Thank here today. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me. Can't wait to see you in person. <laughs> <laughs> Wherever that is. <laughs> thanks for listening, everybody. We'll have all the notes at wish I'd known then podcast.com. See y'all next week. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. We hope this episode inspired you, empowered you, and made you laugh a little bit too. If you loved it, tell your friends about it. And if you feel so inclined, leave us a review. 
We look forward to being with you again next week.